I'm sure, the space at the hospital that where these things get, get thought through. It becomes a sort of social theory, an individual autonomy. I want to hang on to that as a category, but I want to say that's something that only ever properly manifests itself in communities of certain sorts. And I think that general scheme applies to most of the kinds of cases that you're, that you're talking about. I do want to just add, in case you get the wrong idea about Britain, uh, she was not, Mrs. A was not forced to have contraception, although this is not the best interest stage of the decision. The judge found she did not have the capacity to make this decision for her Herself, but he ruled it would not be in her best interest to have the police come to the door once a month to give her an injection. So uh, the, anyway, that, that's the kind of schema I want to use. It's basically a Hegelian schema, I think, for thinking through uh, these sorts of questions. Leaving the question of competence aside for a second, the decision is very difficult and it's cutting off. And I think the decision is a philosophically contested notion. <clears throat> There's a book called uh, The Discovery of Mind. Bruno Snow, and Deckung des Geistes. Geist, what is Geist? But anyway, uh, uh, um, philosophically very well informed, he determines that there are no decisions made by Homeric heroes. And it's an extremely interesting uh, focus. I wrote a book about deliberation in the Odyssey. And I can understand the philosophical motives uh, of Snow. And it also, I think, it's related to decisionism, uh, which is uh, obviously intertwined with phenomenology, certainly in Heidegger. Decisionism would basically, the reason among many, but the reason that really was important for me was that Homeric heroes look at the options and then they decide on the side of the most preponderant motives. So they never make a decision. The decision is made for them by their assessment of the evident situation. Whereas a decision for Snell has to have a kind of moment of complete indeterminacy where I, I decide. Okay, so it's a little existential. Is that a problem? Does that affect your, your, yeah. your talking? I think that your, your other point, just to, to perhaps be more useful, um, I've had to make some difficult decisions and I think it's very good because decision is difficult to have someone to bounce things off of or even to deflect so that what you turn out that I have to, I have to persuade my son that we would be making the right decision about his mother taking her off life support, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, uh. You see what I'm saying? Yes, I do. Yeah, this comes back to some of the points Joan was making as well, um, that you have different sort of interlocutors um, and feeling comfortable. This, what is feeling comfortable? That's a really important category, feeling comfortable with the decision, uh, trying to figure out what that's about. Um, but a lot of that has to do with being able, feeling comfortable in, with different interlocutors. And we also have this ability to what we call run sociality, sociality offline, right? You don't actually have to have your mother or sister there in order to figure out, well, what would they say, right? You can, you can run those objections from Paul, you know, he knows how you, Paul would object to this, so you can do that. There you've got a kind of inbuilt interlocutor. So these are, there are a whole range of these different forms of sociality. I mean, the Snell case, I love the Snell book, I mean, uh, it, it, but it is now very widely refuted, I think, uh, and Bernard Williams, of course, uh, in Shame and Necessity, really put it in his scopes. I always liked Snell's view better. I wanted it to be true. It's such a lovely, a lovely position. Uh, and it's actually been in the news again uh, recently uh, with Will's review in the New York Review of Books of the Dreyfus Kelly. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, not a, it's, it's not an uncontentious interpretation of the Greeks. But look, I mean, you know, I think that, think about the Greek situation. We want to say, so one of the Achilles, you know, some god whispers in his ear and affects his whatever, and then he goes off in that direction. I mean, you could, in this model, think about that as, uh, is that he decided, uh, or is it did the god decide, or was he in a, you know, they had his own distinctive form of decision community, and that was part of it. That was part of it. So the promptings were, were, were there. I think it's flexible. You can read it in, 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 different sorts of, uh, in different sorts of ways. But look, I think too often that we read these sorts of history, and Snell is the, the most guilty of this. You say, what is it to have a mind it's to have, basically, with all due deference to Henry, it's to have a Kantian mind, right? It's to have individual autonomy there. Um, the, and then you measure the history against that sort of standard. I think that's a dangerous strategy because it can, it can lead to the assumption that if others are playing this constitutive role in bringing about my decision, well, then it can't be genuinely autonomous. I think that's too quick, and that's a, it's a mistake that ramifies in practice in all kinds of interesting ways in terms of trying, the, you know, what the farce of consent procedures and trying to think through what to do about that. You get some 
some very misguided initiatives there. People recognize we all sign forms we don't understand, right? We click I agree, uh, and I've read, you know, we have no idea what it is we're agreeing to. That looks like it's a farce, right? Consent has become a farce in these sorts of contexts. And so one response to that is we need to train up all of the people who are engaged in consent procedures to be able to understand all, basically everybody should go to medical school so that they can understand for themselves what that form says. I think that's the mistake, again. It's fine for that knowledge, for that understanding to be distributed in your community. That's in a way, you know, one of the lessons of 20th century philosophy of language as well. The, the division, what does uh, Putnam call it? The division of semantic labor. If you're in a functional decision community, it's actually okay that other people are doing the understanding of that for you as long as you stand in the right sort of relationship to them. Hi, uh, I wanted to ask you to maybe say something more about um, a case you brought up in a response to a question. So about heroin addiction, but maybe about addiction in general. So I know that there's some concern there about whether or not addicts can actually consent legitimately to participate in research or in studies where they would actually be receiving the drug as part of their treatment, right? Mm -hmm. So sort of this idea of, well, is that competent consent, even though they seem to be making this decision, right, to I do want to get better, but nevertheless, sort of the, the carrot, right, is this sort of the drug that they're addicted to. Right. So right. I'm sort of curious if you, I, I imagine you've thought about it, but what you think about that, and then maybe how your sort of uh, phenomenological approach would handle a case, uh, case like that. Yeah, wow. Um, I think I'm going to have to take that as an exercise. I, I haven't really worked much on the addiction cases, and they're really hard. Um, we have been working, there's a, a brilliant woman, uh, Jacinta Tan, uh, who's done a lot of work on anorexia, uh, which has some of, of similar kinds of patterns. Uh, the, and she's really been a pioneer in developing some of these phenomenological approaches. She is really a fearsome critic of the MACCAT T and of, in fact, the MCA, the legal definition of capacity, because she says it's too cognitive right, that what you're testing, those individual uh, cognitive performance, their understanding, their appreciate, the, these, the ability to, to, to calculate costs and benefits, these are basically cognitive operations, but in fact, the competence to make decisions involves values as well, the ability to evaluate appropriately. And uh, that's in fact exactly what she thinks is the capacity robbing disorder in anorexia. And I think something similar will apply to the addiction um, cases. So uh, Tan wants to build values into the, uh, the definition of capacity. So you, know, and you just read these interviews, her papers are lovely because they include these long extracts from the subjects uh, where you know, they'll say, I don't care if I die as long as I die thin. Right? Or the, uh, I, I, you know, I, the doctor told me that I, I'm causing damage to my liver. I mean, isn't it amazing that I was able to do that? You know? the, uh, so there's a disorder. She wants to say there's a disorder in the valleys. Now, you can imagine what the lawyers think. They see this, and they say, whoa, back off. Right? The whole point of this was to give people the right to make bad decisions. Right? That, remember the judicial ruling for any bad reason leading to death? So there's a kind of commitment. This is where it all edges again into Jerry's political philosophy territory. What's the appropriate form of neutrality over values that ought to be enforced in these kinds of contexts? There you've got a real collision between the juridical and the medical, right? Because in a liberal legal order, you've got this juridical commitment to some kind of value neutrality. But of course, medicine is a deeply paternalistic practice that's laden with a conception of what it is to be healthy. And the, so you've got this kind of collision so we're just getting in the middle and trying to help sort it out. But uh, the, uh, I mean, what the, 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 bar the kind of consensus position now has turned against TAN. You don't need to build values into this definition because that what they'll say is it's all there in use and way the ability to use and weigh, the evaluation bit is, is in there. So that's one, I know this is not a direct answer to your question, uh, but I think it's a kind of a, an analogous case where you've got various kinds of value disorders. It's, a, it's, a re, it's really a very, very hard, uh, hard case. I feel a little bit guilty. We got really fascinated with that case because it's philosophically so interesting. But in fact, when you look at the clinical cases, the anorexic patients like that are this tiny slice of the clinical population. It's the, you know, it's the severely depressed cases and uh, the various kinds of psychosis or the, the majority of the cases you actually see. One more question from David. Uh, over the microphone. Um, 
Thanks, Wayne. So um, I, I was wondering if uh, tests are supposed to be um, uh, common for multiple purposes. Uh, I mean, we started by talking about a competence to consent to treatment, but at times there's been talk about other purposes, and so there might be a competence test for um, involuntary commitment. There might be a competence test for custodial care and things like that. And the, the worry is that a test that might be appropriate for some purposes might not be appropriate for others. Yeah. And in particular, the worry might be, unless I misheard it, um, that the MACAT-T test tends to be um, cognitive primarily, not cognitive rather than evaluational, but cognitive rather than volitional. And where cognitive can include evaluational, but we might think that part of being competent was not only the ability to discriminate appropriate from inappropriate courses of action and so forth, but also the ability to regulate the will in accordance with those discriminations. And that required certain executive or volitional capacities that at least as I, on a very brief survey, it wasn't clear to me that they're tested yes. well by the MACCAT uh, T test. And so, for certain kinds of um, consent to care, where I decide now and I consent to the care, if they wheel me into the other room and I have the procedure, and so there's no real implementation issue on my part, then a purely cognitive test might be okay. But in a lot of these other cases, that um, there's issues about regulating your will in accordance with, and if you're depressive or you're addicted or something like that, you might be able to make the relevant cognitive discriminations, but you might not be able to regulate your will yes. successfully. Right. Even in consent to treatment, if the treatment's over an extended period of time and requires your cooperation, um, it might be that it has volitional as well as cognitive dimensions. So I'm wondering if, um, if for some purposes, even some consent to treatment purposes, the volitional dimensions of competence are important, whether that raises questions about the adequacy of the tests. Yes, good, thank you. I hadn't thought of putting it in just that way, but I think that's very helpful. Uh, so for me, this is one of the places where time comes back into the story. Time crops up all over the place. So just to answer, first of all, the direct question, uh, the, uh, first of all, a lot of these things that you're contrasting to treatment, for the purposes of the law, they will count as treatment. Um, so being placed on a ward or being committed, uh, uh, submitting to some program of supervised care and so on, those will all come under, uh, come under treatment. And then the law is very explicit, and the, uh, Grisso and Applebaum also adopt this model. There's not some once and for all threshold of what your capacity is. It's got to be keyed to the severity of the decision that you've that, that you're facing. So that's one thing. It has this ability to be adapted. And as the stakes grow higher, um, you know, the, the standard gets higher. If it becomes a life and death uh, decision, the standard of competence is going to, going to rise. So there's some, that kind of flexibility in the test. But so that doesn't come to the main point you're making about the volitional uh, capacities. Um, so it seems to me, the way I think about this, this is again one of the shortcomings of the test, is that it tests your capacity at this particular time. Here's the 20 minute. Uh, so sometimes Chris and Alphabon will tell you there's certain conditions when you ought to run another test, and of course you ought to have your eye out for deteriorating or rising capacity, fluctuating capacity, and so on. Uh, but the fact of the matter is you're making a decision about capacity at that time. What you're talking about, these executive functions, are essentially spread out over time. And so if you just take this time slice kind of approach, you're going to miss the phenomenon. Right? The other case I was going to talk about, I won't go into detail about it now because I can see Don's anxious about time, but it is a guy who consents at one time and then withdraws his consent at another time, and then he consents at another time. This actually coincides with the cycle of his medication. It's a real dilemma. What do you do in this kind of situation? And one of the things, that the, under the Matt T approach, you keep banging your head against the wall. You know, you measure them at this time. But if you're a Heideggerian, you realize, well, it's the whole collection of these are him, right? That what you shouldn't be testing just manifestations of him at this time, but manifestations of him, oh, he is this thing that's, that's spread out over time, and it's his capacity that you're trying to assess. So we've been arguing for bringing in what we call temporal capacities, the ability to bring together these different aspects of your temporal situation, your, your, 